Welcome to Constant Variables, a podcast where we take a non-technical look at mobile app development. I'm Tim Bornholt. Let's get nerdy. Well, today on the show, we are speaking with Amanda Brooks. Amanda is the inventor of FastSack, which is a distance-based mobile app for running, walking, biking, hiking, pretty much travel in general. Uh, the app generates routes for you that you can explore wherever you are in the country. And it's a really useful app if you're in a new town, for example, you're on vacation, you're uh, something for business, and you want to get a route for going around the hotel. That's kind of the, the impetus for the app, as Amanda explains in the episode. And if you haven't downloaded it already, Go to the App Store, type in FastSack, and give it a try. It's a really, really slick app. Uh, Amanda and I, we've, we've known each other for a little bit, in the, and we've chatted in the past, and whenever we've chatted, uh, afterwards, she's referred to it as her therapy session, uh, which I think um, it's that's exactly what I took away from this as well. I learned just as much of it uh, from, from this episode as she did, and our wide-ranging conversation is perfect if you are someone who is interested in becoming an app entrepreneur yourself. So in this episode, you will learn the importance for developing patience with mobile app development, whether a patent is necessary for getting an app started, and some strategies for dealing with technology when you aren't exactly a technology-minded person yourself. So without further ado, here is my interview with Amanda Brooks. Amanda Brooks, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to uh, learn more and, and have this conversation. Me too. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to be the one doing the learning, so I hope you're ready for that. Oh, uh, well, there's always room for me to learn as well. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about FastSack and, and what led you to actually create this app of yours. Yeah, you know, it's kind of been a long, drawn-out story. Um, Dating back to 2005, I was uh, traveling a lot for work, um, training for a lot of races, and um, would get to a city and was continually frustrated when I would go to approach a hotel and say, where should I run? And they would tell me, oh, just go down the street for, you know, five miles and turn around and come back. Or, you know, you can go circle this um, this plot of a park that's maybe a half mile loop that's outside of the hotel. And I, I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way uh, to see the city and be able to uh, create a route based on the distance that I want um and and just be able to explore without having to either carry a paper map or just run city streets for five miles. Um, my husband is a patent attorney, and at that time, all that really existed was the Garmin Street Pilot. It was pre-smartphone and pre-mobile apps. And so your Garmin Street Pilot would, you know, dock in your car and you'd enter in a destination and it would route you there, but you didn't have any ability to do a round trip route and you didn't have any ability to enter in a distance or landmark. So we just kind of took it from there and started trying to figure out how we could um, create the technology behind that. And we were able to patent some of the technology, but it took then, you know, probably 10 years beyond that to have any bandwidth or wherewithal to create an app and find people who could help us create an algorithm that would generate a route that we were looking for. That's awesome that you stuck with it for so long. I mean, a lot of people have the idea and then, you know, approach somebody like me or approach somebody that can can build an app and haven't really thought it through where, you know, after 10 years of, of waiting for the technology to catch up, I'm sure you had a lot of thought and a lot of time to, to put into what the app could look like and, and how it would function. Absolutely. You know, it's been it's been a really big learning curve. Um, it's been expensive, but <laughs> not anything. Yeah, as we all we all you know, it's self funded, and it's nothing that we would regret though either, because of you know all of the things you do learn in the process, and all of the conversations you get to have, and the people you meet. Um, it helps that I was really passionate about running, um, and so despite the fact that we took a break from you know, doing any type of developing and put it on the back burner due to jobs and kids and things of that nature. Um, There was always the consistency of running um, in my background and always the consistency of traveling for jobs. And so that kind of kept it in the the forethought that even though we weren't actively developing it, we were still having conversations about what it would look like. 
and that, that I think that's touches on a lot of really good points that we'll go into. I mean, not only just we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the money side of things, but also about how you really got to have a passion if you're going to be running. I mean, any business, but if you're going to be running an app business, especially where there's a lot of capital and a lot of things that can go wrong and a lot of uh, turmoil. I mean, if you don't have that passion to see something through, um, you know, what's what's the point? Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's a very, um, it's a scary endeavor for anyone to go out into their own business. And there are always great supporters and there are lots of naysayers. And, you know, you, you realize and you learn that you just kind of have to chart your own course. And, and as you say, stick with it because it's, it's not a 5k. It's, you know, as somebody said to me a month ago, it's an ultra marathon to be (laughs) in this business. And you have to appreciate that, you know, even if you develop an app, well, so what, you know, you still have to market it and you may have only developed, you know, a minimally viable product. So you've got this bundle in this package that you have to, to do something with. And that takes, you know, a lot of sticking power and a lot of additional capital and having conversations and knowing the right people to even ask the questions of to, to get it beyond the technical portion. Yeah. And man, there's a lot in there. I, I guess yeah. one question I, I've had um, with in, in relating to all this is if somebody asks you, uh, is FastTech an app or a business? How would you, what would you answer to that? Do, do you, do you consider FastTech to be more of like the, the mobile app side of things, or do you really look at it as the more holistic, the, the business altogether? Um, I think it is a um, ever evolving process. Um Going into this entirely blind, I would have said to you three years ago, we're going to develop an app and um, if you build it, they will come. It's going to be an instant business. We launch into an app store. You sell apps, you recoup your cost, and voila, you have a business. Um, The app market is so flooded. The running industry is so flooded. Um, You know, we've, we've learned through the process that what we thought our revenue model and business model was, is not the reality at all. Um, People aren't buying apps. You're not recouping costs in that manner. And so you have to pivot and spin and redefine and figure out if this is going to be viable versus a very expensive hobby, how do you, how do you turn it into a business? So um, there was certainly some naivety in the beginning. And I think it's eyes wide open now, but still, how do you get to that revenue point? Yeah. And and I think there's a lot of corollaries uh, to software development in general from my side. um, There's, you might clearly see a finish line and you know that the end product being shipped to the store is, is the the goal. Um, But along that way, there are, you know, I'm banging my head against the keyboard every day trying to make code work because things are unpredictable. Things pop up and, and uh, as, as predictable as software should be, because it's all just computers and algorithms and there's no variability. Uh, You throw the human factor into it and things change all the time. You get competitors come out of nowhere you get uh, a deal that you thought might go through with a partner falls through you 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 get put into a marketplace where there's 70 other running apps out there and how do you differentiate yourself from there so yeah I, i totally can see why there's a lot of need for adaptability and and being able to respond to change absolutely and you you know you have to have that sticking power to get through those and you have to have a supportive group of people around you as well because it's not you know a 6 month time chunk and and then you see results you have to keep um trudging through and figuring out okay as you say what is the next step and what what code may or may not work and how does this translate in the market once you hand it to someone you have a vision of how it should work and it makes perfect sense to you. And then you get a thousand people coming back and saying, well, I don't like this, or could you add this? Or have you thought about this? And there are dollar signs attached to all of those questions. Mm -hmm. And so trying to find that package that appeals to a consumer or appeals to a group and helps you turn revenue while also continuing to spark your fire is, is a pretty big package to put together. Yeah. And there's nothing, you know, until you get to that point, there's nothing really tangible that you're selling. It's not like I'm I'm churning out really cool, trendy T-shirts that I can put right out onto a marketplace and sell and get costs back. It's a very vague, vague process. And it's very hard to determine where does this 
snippet of technology fit into in terms of society and use and and consumer consumerism? Yeah, that that is a really good point. That um, and, and it's something I struggle with all the time. That I'm spend all my time sitting in front of a computer typing things, and while I'm you know producing value and there's work that's coming out of it. Um, at the end of the day, it's still just a piece of code. It's not like if I, you know, if I was a mechanic and my car broke down on the side of the road, I'd be able to to fix it, you know, or, or if I was building uh, woodworking and I was making a canoe or something, like I'm making something right. tangible that you can put out into the world and show that you're producing value, but with software, um, it, it's interesting. There's there's um, obviously things you're doing and you're making value for people, but it's it is kind of interesting to it's a, it's a different mindset you have to wrap around that you're not producing something uh, physical. You're just no. doing everything is virtual. And what is the value level to people? I mean, and and you know, my husband and I talk about that as well. Is that we're not really sol- you know solving a world problem. You know, we're yeah. we're it's a novelty item. You're, you're giving somebody the ability to land somewhere and generate a route, um, you know, based on a distance they want. And it's, it's fun and unique and it's entertaining to do. And I love to sit just at random stoplights and, you know, it picks up where I'm located and I can see, you know, what's around me and where I might go, but it's not, world hunger and it's not, you know, an educational issue. So it's, it's figuring out in, in these, very busy worlds and everybody's flooded environment of what value does it hold to someone? Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting. Cause yeah, most apps, um, I, I, there's a statistic that I keep throwing around. I should actually look it up and know it for sure. But there's, um, <laughs> there's a, uh, I, I read somewhere that it's something like most people use 12 apps on their phone total. Um, and that includes things like your phone, the clock, your calendar, um, your text messaging app, like right there, that's a, a third of the apps that you're ever going to use on your phone in a given week. And, right. uh, to be able to be one of those apps that, can fit in among those 12, um, you know, you really got to be producing some serious value in order to be, you know, somebody coming back and, and not saying like, you know, FastHack specifically, like, like you've said, it's not necessarily like every day you're going in and creating a new route or anything. It's more of a novelty of, oh, I'm at a new spot in town and oh, oh yeah, I should use FastHack to see where I should go running. That it, it's more of uh, finding how you can hook into people's uh, thought processes and get them to uh, remember to use FastSack at those times. Um, that's really the the more of the challenge as opposed to, I mean, that it is a challenge to to build the technology. Yes, but there's a, probably a lot more challenges on the on your side of, of the business side of, of getting people to keep coming back to the app. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the hurdle, you know, we, we thought the initial hurdle was how do you develop this algorithm that will, you know, generate a route. And so it's, it's wonderful and amazing to work with people who have the brilliance that they can, they can create that. But you're right. I mean, so you've got this fabulous algorithm, but how do you, how do you take that to the next level? How do you capture people's attention, continue to capture people's attention so you don't become obsolete and then, you know, pivot pivot and redefine into, okay, that's not the path that we thought this great algorithm would take. How do we now make it into something else else and still remain relevant? Absolutely. And, and speaking of those uh, incredible, brilliant people that do the tech yeah. side of things, um, <laughs> with uh, like we've like we've I mean, if, if anybody knows you and, and I've known you for a little bit now and we've talked and yeah. I know that you would never proclaim to be the, the queen of tech. Um, oh, no. But at the at the same time, I mean, you're running a, a pretty sophisticated piece of software um, with a lot of, of technical things that need to be like, that, that you as the business owner need to be able to communicate to your customers to, to say, here's the value of what we're we're delivering so to that front i mean how do you deal with with building a business and not having especially a business around apps and not having any of that technical expertise um you know i think a lot of it is is just being very human and um and being very honest and straightforward with people that I spend a lot of time saying I need to um, chat with my tech team or let me discuss it with my developer before I come back with any answers or, you know, pulling in the likes of, of talents like yours um, or, you know, talents like Taylor Sampson, who has done all of the algorithm development and back end coding um, to to have those relationships where you you find the right people who who speak it in standard language. So someone like myself who does not have a tech background can, you know, take that information, 
package and bundle it and run to have conversations that sound at least a little bit intelligent. Um, but it's always defaulting to other people on my team to say, I need to pull somebody in with more knowledge to answer those questions. Yeah, and that's really what makes business exciting and fun is everyone has different strengths and talents and um, not knowing technology while building a, a tech app, you know, that that could be seen as weird uh, or, right. or you know, a, a, a handicap. But really, um, you don't need to know all the tech for everything in order to pull it off. I mean, as long as you surround yourself with people who can translate it and not and I think the big thing, too, is just it, like you said, it's all about humanity and, and not making somebody feel bad or uh, like dumb for not knowing something, but being able to say, hey, I need help understanding this or learning it. That's right. that's really it, it's it's not you know, hard to understand if somebody can at least break it down simply for you. Yeah, I think it's, you know, finding the right people, finding the right synergy, um, you know, and there, there were plenty of conversations that I've had with people who are well-meaning, but they speak the language in a different way that I can't understand. And you want to find the right group of people where you can ask the question. And I know I've bounced plenty of ideas off of you and, you know, and, and have been very, um, transparent in terms of saying, I don't even know if I'm using the right word. Is this the right technology term? And what does, you know, an API versus an SDK mean? And, you know, how does that translate so that when I go have a conversation with somebody who's very technologically advanced or somebody who's like me and came out of psychology, that I'm not sounding like I'm entirely uninformed. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, how do you keep up with the changing tech, tech trends then? I mean, over the course of 10 years, like you said, we went from uh, giant blocks that you put on your dashboard to give you directions right. that would drive you into a lake. And now we have these smart devices that can bring you to the middle of nowhere to even houses that they have addresses but don't even exist yet. Um, how, do yeah. you keep, how do you keep up with those changing tech trends as, as somebody who's not you know, necessarily tech savvy uh, on your own end? Right. You know, I would say that is one of the biggest stumbling blocks um, because I don't have the knowledge um, and can't do the constant upkeep and changing and staying on top of things. I'm really at um, at the mercy of someone like Taylor. And, um, you know, truth be told, in reality, we both have daytime jobs. We both have families. A lot of our communication happens um, online. It happens at night, on the weekends. Um and so this isn't our full-time job and you develop a lot of patience that um, you want the answer yesterday and the person you're talking to wants the answer yesterday and you might not be able to get it for another week or your server build might not be um, up to speed because people have life events that are happening and you just learn to um, breathe deep have patience and know that it's going to unfold um, as it's going to unfold. And there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, if this were my full-time job and my kids' college educations were riding on it, then I would probably have a whole lot more urgency <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of it. But it's, it's, you know, I'm very fortunate to have the ability to do this and build this and have the support of my family to even be able to play with it. So I'd love it to be at the next level. Um, I'd love to have somebody full time that we're constantly bouncing ideas off through the day, but, but that's not the reality of my situation right now. That makes sense. And yeah, that's, it's good to have, um, good expectations because with anything in life, you if you, if you, uh, go into it thinking that it's going to be all grand and wonderful without, uh, much work being put into it or whatever. I mean, you, you, you learn really quickly how, how much effort it is to build a business just in general, and then building a, a tech business on top of that, where things move even faster than if you were building a t-shirt store or right. you know, woodworking or something. It's, it is, it's a, a totally different ball park. Right. And, you know, with, with Jay in, in the, you know, intellectual property field and, and patent law, you know, I have a, a consistent and constant gut check from him of, you know, there's disruptive technology that's coming out by the minute. Um, you know, he's drafting patents on stuff that, that is, you know, five years down the road that, you know, I can't even wrap my head around. And so, to think that you're going to continue to sink hordes of money into something that may be obsolete in a week, you know, you, you have to just, you have to keep it into perspective. Absolutely. 
Um, I, I do want to touch on the patent stuff in a second, but I, I wanted to ask you first, um, do you think that the, the changing, how quickly tech is changing and, and all of that stuff has been the most surprising part of running FastAC? Or what would you say is is actually the most surprising part of, of doing FastAC? Oh, gosh. You know, I think the most surprising part or maybe the most rewarding part has been um, have been the relationships that I've been able to form that, um, you know, you think you're going into a business of creating a running app and you really are um, rewarded with relationships um, and people who cheerlead for you from across the country for, you know, no other reason than they're excited for you. Um, and so, I think that's been the most surprising thing. Certainly, um, you have your naysayers and you have this ever-changing environment of technology, but it's it's been really rewarding to build a business, to say you've built an app and um, to kind of check your ego as well, to say that um, there's no shame in saying, I tried really hard and we took it to this level and we can't take it on, or we've tried really hard and we're pivoting and this is what it's becoming, um, or bringing on partners and, and having different relationships um, evolve as you develop or you know ebb and flow through through the technology phases. Uh, yeah, I think um, that's one thing I've been learning too over the years is um, the, as big as the world is with 7 billion people in it, um, it, it's amazing how small the world is too and that the same names keep coming up oh and it's gosh. all based on, you know, uh, you might have run a race 10 years ago with somebody and then they pop up on your LinkedIn and say, hey, I've been using FASAC or, you know, however that works. Like yeah. it happens to me all the time where people that I talked to once eight years ago and gave them advice on how to build an app, they remember that and, and it's, uh, they come back to you cause you build, you know, you, you gave them that little bit of information. So it, it's, yeah. it is crazy how, how small the world can be. It is absolutely. And, you know, I think it's that whole, um, you know, mantra, I guess, of kindness begets kindness. And, um, in the running world is, is a very tightly knit small community as large and vast it is, is, um, and especially, um, in Minnesota, in our area, I'm amazed at the interconnectedness of people, um, and, you know, connections that one person gives you that leads to just a slew of other conversations and insight that, you know, you may not have had if you hadn't reached out to say, give me some advice or, you know, what do you think of this? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I, I miss it. I'm currently on week four of, of an unknown amount of weeks on crutches and I, I haven't been oh. able to run for, for a couple of months. And it's like just being able to go to a race and be around that environment. It is crazy how great the, uh, the running community is around here. Yeah. That energy, you can't, you can't, you can't replace it. It's, it's, it's a pretty good community of people. Absolutely. So switching, switching gears ever so yeah. slightly. Um, you had mentioned um, all your experience with, with working with patents and, um, and with your husband being a patent attorney. And um, I, I'm curious, I, I hear a lot, uh, it, being in this space, there's a lot of mixed uh, messages about, you know, the need for a patent and the need for, um, you know, just, just software patents in general. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear what your thoughts are on the process, seeing that I, I would assume, you know, that, that Jay didn't charge you too much for, uh, uh, working with you for the patents, but, um, what are your thoughts on, on the need for having something patented? And if, if somebody was looking, uh, at the early stages of, of doing an app, you know, would you advise them on doing a patent or, um, I mean, I know you're not a lawyer, but I just, I'm just curious to hear what your, what your thoughts are since you kind of have a unique position here on that. Right. Um, correct. So Jay, out of the kindness of his heart, um, spent a summer vacation drafting the patent for me. So, um, <laughs> I was very lucky to have that. They're super expensive. And what people don't appreciate is that, um, it's a long drawn out process. So you're submitting your, you know, your application, uh, the technical paper, so to speak, to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and it's going through, you know, 18 months, two years worth of um, iterations and reviews and office actions um, with the Patent and Trademark Office before you ever are are getting any. Um, validation or uh, formal documents back to say, hey, you've patented this. And, you know, they may see um, existing um, technology that's been 
uh, filed for years back that comes up and conflicts with what you're doing and you have to figure out ways to, you know, operate around that. And it's, it's just a big undertaking. And so, you know, Jay could advise much more on this, but I, I don't know if I would advise the process. I think if you're trying to take it to market um, and you can get out to market, then you should probably take it to market because, you know, realistically, we patented some of the technology back in 2005, but missed the boat in terms of coming out in advance of, um, you know, some of the other groups that create mapping and routes and, um, and so what am I going to do? They're, they're much larger groups. Am I going to now go sue them and say, hey, I've got this piece of paper. I mean, I'm going to get dusted. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't have the funds to support that. And so you just, I think, want to carve out your space of where can you exist and how can you coexist. And, um, you know, Jay would say the smartest people in business are finding out how to work together and have the conversations. They're not saber rattling and, you know slapping people with cease and desist letters they're they're trying to find a way to exist and work within the the environment that that's very well said i i think um you know from my experience and everything with patents I, i've never gone through the the filing process myself but i've worked with a lot of clients that that before they come see me you know they've been through that the 18 month two-year process of getting the thing patented before they even start and it's like in this space where there's uh, things like you've said before, they move so fast. Um, your technology idea in two years, uh, it, like, what, what are the right. odds you've, that that's going to yeah. still be there? You know, that's that is exactly right. And you know, some of the some of the technology and the the um, the patent is based on our algorithm, which you know probably has some value, but but you're right. It moves so quickly. And if you have the opportunity to take something to market versus sitting on it for 18 months to two years with a, you know, ambiguous ending, then I would say if you have the bandwidth and wherewithal, you know, roll it out, roll it forward, see what type of response you get, and then, you know, find the right relationships. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, like you had said before with, um, uh, with money and everything, uh, it, with just apps being expensive as it is, um, throwing yeah. on another, you know, five figures plus to, to be doing the patent stuff. And it can, it can be even more than that. It can get up into the six figures if you're really, you know, going whole hog with things, uh, you know, would that money be better spent? going to market and getting your product out the door and then kind of coming back after that. I, I, I would probably think so, but that's, you know, that's up to some people to really like having the protection too that a, that a patent could afford you. Um, yeah, but, I think it's, it's unique. Um, you know, it's based on what the areas that you're, you're operating in, you know, if you're a medical device, well, that's a whole lot different yeah. than, you know, a, a technology behind an app. And so it's, um, you know, if you're looking at semiconductor technology, if you're looking at, you know, chemistries and things of that nature, then it's it's a whole whole different ball of wax. Totally. And and like you had said, I mean, the, there's um, there's the money up front in securing the patent. But really, a patent is just a piece of paper that that looks fancy that unless you have the money to go after companies that infringe on your patent, it's, like it's up to you to defend it. Um, and and it's like, like looking at um, some of the figures I've seen for what Apple and, and Google and, and Facebook have for their legal budgets. It's like one tenth of a tenth of a percent of their legal budget would probably be enough to completely snuff out anybody like, that comes Absolutely. after them, you know? So it's like, are you willing to contend against somebody that has like, uh, like a nine figure budget for just legal protection? Like, like right. what are you going to do? And people, you know, people on their staff and team that are spending their entire day defending. Um, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm a one person shop. And so, yeah, you have to, you have to pick your battles and you have to figure out how do you want to define yourself. And a lot of that is ever evolving, but I know Jay would say, you know, what's your exit strategy? What do you, what do you hope to achieve if you're going to patent something? Because you may be able to do it without that type of, um, you know, formal document behind you. Right. And then at the end of the day, I think um, both 
patents and we we deal with a lot of non-disclosure agreements in our space too that people um are really thinking that uh their idea or that the just like you know having just i had an idea that that's enough for you to build a multi-million dollar app that you're gonna sell off to somebody at the end of the day um but from my experience things like like going after patents or, or spending a whole ton of time fighting over a non-disclosure agreement um, just to protect your idea. It's like, I, I think at the end of the day, people are are overvaluing just a, the nugget of the idea and not really thinking through, you know, what is that? Like you said, like, what is a patent going to get you at the end of the day? Same with like, what is a non-disclosure going to get you at the end of the day? Um, I think like at the end of the day, a non-disclosure is a pretty poor substitute for me trusting you to not take your idea and run away and, and steal it. I mean, that that it's kind of the same with a patent it's like what it's just giving you a piece of paper that says you invented something it doesn't you know make it so no one's going to take your idea ever correct and there you know it doesn't make it so people won't design around you and it doesn't take you to market and you know so so there you know i i think it's so specific to the industry area that you're in and um you know, having those conversations and building that team around you, people who can advise and and having the right people, you know, approaching intellectual property groups to say, you know, help me do a search to yeah. find out what's out there. And, and is this even um, realistic and viable to to pursue protecting? Yeah. And 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 to to that point as well, um, you know, it, it's so much nicer, like you've been saying before, it's like building relationships with people, building uh sharing your ideas and, and putting kindness out into the world and working together to, to build stuff is going to, I think at the end of the day, I've seen any business that I've worked with that's been successful. The businesses that do that, where they're not, um, you know, worrying about patents and NDAs, they're worrying about, I want to build this really cool product and I want to get it out into the world. How can I help you? And how can you help me make that happen? That seems to be a much more viable strategy than I'm going to lawyer up and legal up and, and shut down and not tell anybody my idea and not work with anybody. Right. And Jay, you know, as an attorney would, would, you know, he often laughs and says the same thing, like keep, keep the lawyers out of it because, you know, it, there's, there's a certain um, level of skepticism in relationships. And once you start involving all the, you know, contracts and you, you lose that, some of that human relationship um, and ability to trust and gut check. And, and I think we're all pretty good at, at gut checking. And I think if there are red flags, we, we would probably do ourselves a lot of service to, to listen to them and, and build the relationships with people that we feel comfortable with and, and transparent. Yeah, absolutely. Well, not to, you know, I don't want to keep harping on uh, uh, lawyers and patents and all that fun stuff. I think and get back into some more uh, fast act specific stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, knowing what you know now, after going through this long process uh, of getting a, a patent and getting uh, the the app built and, and figuring out all the technology, um, what would you do differently at this point? Oh gosh, you know, um, I think that I would seek out. Um, and, and I say this, I, I would seek out advice um, from more people, but in the space and field that we're operating in, some of it is an uncharted course. Um, and so a lot of it is the whole hindsight and you learn, you know, so much about the direction you want to take by going through specific steps and spending money where um, you want to kick yourself afterwards and say, oh, I wish I had that chunk of money back because this is how I would apply it. Um, I know you and I have had this conversation that um, I probably spent the first year of our existence um, going and peddling myself at um, run groups and marathons and um, you know, standing at booths and talking to people and thinking that, oh my gosh, if I go and spend this money and stand at this event, then we're going to get a hundred thousand users out of this. And you realize that that's maybe not your best reach and you're not, not your best um, use of resources. And there are so many hidden costs that you don't know about until you get there. And so, um, those are always the questions that I answer for people. I'll have, you know, People who will even ask me as just a layperson, you know, what do you think of this event or what do you think of approaching it from this vantage point? And so I always like to give people that information of, you know, this is your real cost and this is your time outlay and are your funds used 
better elsewhere. Um, you know, most of our users are on iOS. I probably wouldn't have spent the money to build the Android side of things. Um, I probably would have kept to one platform. But at that point, we were having conversations with a couple of different groups who were saying to us, if we're going to put it in front of our, our users, our consumers, we want both sides of the spectrum. And so you take that leap and then things don't come to fruition, but you just have to put it behind you and move forward and not continue to kick yourself in the shin. It's it's uh, ever evolving. I mean, it's just like life. You're you, if you're not learning and growing and doing, then you're kind of just sitting still and not not uh, not learning anything. So I guess it's it's sometimes learning by the hard way is almost uh, it's not better, but it's you know that that's something you got to do sometimes in life is just go for it and see what happens, learn your mistakes. See what and, happens. Yeah, yeah, and you know to. Um, to be able to, I guess, to have the bandwidth to make those mistakes too and not to feel silly or stupid or ridiculous about it that you've, you know, you've done your best. And, and it's a, again, it's a very, um, it's a very privileged position to be in, to be able to say, uh, you know, I've, I've been able to go out and try this and do this. Um, so, you know, I'm incredibly thankful to, the family and to the people that I've worked with who have, you know, allowed that dream to spark and live and um, continue to create because, you know, it's, it's four times, five times more expensive than you ever envision it to be. And so it, you're con constantly doing a gut check on, um, you know, how does this financially make sense and what would I do differently? It's, you know, it keeps, it still keeps me up at night and, um, you know, fuels many of my, my 3 a.m. emails to you and Taylor and anyone else. So <laughs> that that makes perfect sense. I I'm uh, you mentioned a couple of times with the with the money side of things, and I know that a lot of people who jump into app development don't necessarily. Uh, understand that the, the money side of things. So it, it, um, real quick, I wanted to touch on that of um, you, you even said the phrase hidden costs. And I'm curious to hear, uh, you know, because from from my side, from the technical side, um, you know, I've, I've been doing this long enough where there's things uh, that I've learned <laughs> over the years by mistake and by uh, trial and error. And you learn what all the costs are. But then when I'm in my position trying to iterate to somebody, well, here's how much an app is going to cost you in the long run, I might forget certain things. So I'm, I'm really uh, excited, I guess, is, is maybe too strong a word, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm interested to hear what, um, what, what your experience was with hidden costs and where things that you weren't expecting kind of jumped up at you and, and made you go, huh, I didn't realize that was going to cost as much as it did. Yeah, I would, I think the whole um, experience was more um, expensive than I could have ever imagined. Um, I, two years ago, three years ago, I would have thought, well, my gosh, there's so many apps. They, it can't be hard to build. It can't be expensive. $10,000. Um, and so you realize very quickly that there are so many layers um, behind it. And if you're not a shop that's building it on your own, I mean, you're paying someone, um, you know, an hourly rate or you're paying someone um, for a project scope and as you're having the conversations with the people, if you're if you're fortunate enough to find somebody who will really you know brainstorm with you and allow you to you know spin off on these tangents, um, and then they're giving you a statement of work, and you're realizing that all of these brilliant ideas that you have cost a lot of money, and you know you've built this structure, and now you want to go this direction. Well, that you know it's it's not just like building a Lego castle where you just pick up the next brick and you put it on top and, you know, you keep building upwards. There's all these different tangents and pathways and technology factors that the people behind the scenes are, are taking into account at a real cost. Um, and even to, you know, reassess the direction you want to go is, is a cost. I mean, they're not, people aren't working for free and, um, and, and I think that's part of the frustrating part when you're a non-tech person because you don't have your head wrapped around what that cost looks like and you feel like you've got all these brilliant pathways to go and, and you also have cost restrictions. 
that that that's really helpful to to hear and I, i'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this are in the same boat too of um you know, somebody comes to me and, and the first quote, they, they, they tell me the idea, just the, the super high, and this is after four NDAs, of course, um, you hear the, you hear the, the super high level did, did idea. Did I make you sign one too? Or <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. I, I'm sure, I'm sure just because again, like of who your, your husband is, I'm sure you, you did have me sign something, but that's okay. I, I've also known you through, through other You've things. You've forgiven so me. It's, it's, it's just fine. Uh, and it's not, again, I'm, I, it's not to, to rag on that. That's just a, no. a, a specific example. But um, where was I going with that now? Shoot. Um, coming to me with an idea. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, somebody will come to me with an idea and, and uh, it'll be something like, uh, they, they tell me the very, very basic idea and then say, how much is it going to cost? And yeah. from my end, uh, you know, you, you, it, it, it all comes, like we've said, you know, ideas are worthless, but execution is priceless. And sure. knowing how you execute on the idea is really how I can tell you how much something is going to cost where you can do it one way and it's going to cost you, you know, $300 to put something together. That'll do that. Um, or I could see it and it will cost you $3 million if you do it a right. different way. And, and I could see why in your shoes, um, if you just say, I just want an app that'll make routes that, right. how, how is that hard to understand? And it's like, I'm sure now over time you've seen like, well, there's, there's all these different algorithms you can use to compute a route. There's all these different variables of, do we want to be on a trail? Do we want to be on a road? Do you want to be on a sidewalk? Like having all of the different things that can go into it and how, like you said, it's, it's kind of like a Lego castle, but also not that you can't just, um, like pick up something and go like, once you've built it, you have to continue to evolve and care for it. And that, that makes a lot of sense that there would be, um, it, it's hard to, to, unless you're in it every day, like I am, where I can see like, yeah, putting a camera into an app might be, that might simplistically, it, it might sound really simplistic a, as an idea, but for me to actually go in and say, okay, well on Android, there's, there's there's more than a million different Android devices that use, um, you know, of those devices, there's probably 10,000 different camera modules that are in there. And then you have to think that some of them, they actually install them the wrong way upside down. So you have to factor in like, okay, well, where, how is that orientated? And there's like, there's so many things that like you get going on a tangent of like, okay, well, yeah, I just want a camera. And it's like, from my end, no, you, you want a camera, but what you actually want is to support everything, you know, so you, you can kind of see how it would, I, I can see how it would be really frustrating that having to articulate that to you of like, no, it's not just as simple as it seems. Right. Well, and wanting to, you know, wanting to add features and being excited about something and then realizing, um, you know, as you spout out five, 10 different ideas of, you know, and then ask someone, would you price each of these out for me? And then, you know, starting to tick away things that, well, we can't do that. And, you know, we can't, if we take this step, then we have to take this step and that's an additional cost. And, you know, and developing as, as I shared earlier for iOS and Android, you know, they warned me, you don't just have one child now, now you have two children and they operate on entirely different systems. And so every change, you know, you make to the iOS side, are you now going to, you know, make that same um, adjustment and change and upgrade to the Android side? And, you know, it, you hear what they're saying and you, you're you processing it and, and then you're not understanding. I mean, until you're in the thick of it, you're not appreciating the cost ramifications. Um, you're not appreciating the, the upkeep. I mean, just like having someone draft a patent for you, you're not just drafting the patent. There's, you know, there's server costs, there's upkeep costs every time you know, Apple doesn't upgrade, does that impact the way that your app functions? And then do you have a developer in there who has to tinker with it um, to continue to even just be functional as it is? I mean, not even adding a new feature. This is, can I purely maintain what I'm doing now? And so there are all those types of costs that, that just kind of hit you from the side and and quickly you're, you know, you you've absorbed all kinds of stuff that you you didn't intend to pay for because you didn't even know it existed. Mm, yeah. 
that that makes sense and and it's it stinks because you when you um i i hope i i really hope that this episode doesn't feel like uh hey you want to have an app and then just a backhand across the face <laughs> <Right>. of, like, <laughs> you know um because because i think that there's uh, a lot of people um like you said like there, there's a lot of not i would like naivety or whatever however you know being naive um is not necessarily the right phrase for it but there's just uh you know, it, it's not like a willful ignorance or anything. It's just you come and you see like the the amazing things that technology can do for you. And then you see like everyone holds an iPhone. You know, you probably don't remember the very first time you held an iPhone. Like most people don't. But I remember like the first I remember very vividly the first time I touched the iPhone and and was playing around with it. And it's just your mind explodes with ideas of things that this little pocket computer can can do. And so um, the, but people, you know, don't don't factor in when they are in that phase i mean it's it's great to think of all those cool things that the phone can do but you get into uh um you know going back it's like we've only basically tricked rocks into thinking you know like a hundred years ago and that's where we're at right now is it's like we're we're in very infant stages and and think of how hard it is to to do that to just like <laughs> make a rock think which is like what what a processor does so um it, it's interesting because you you, uh, you don't want to squash somebody's notions of right. owning an, an app or a business, but I think that's like having that kind of like you said, it's a reality check of um, apps are really expensive, and the the skills it takes to pull it off are not cheap, uh, especially if you stay in the United States or if you, I mean, God forbid you go to California or something like that, where we're hiring developers. I mean, in Minnesota, you're you're going to find developers for you know between a hundred and two hundred dollars an hour um, right. depending on what service you're doing and then you go out to to california or new york and i mean it's doubled or tripled that because that's just that's what it is so just going into it with the clear expectation that you're going to spend money and it's not a few hundred bucks or a few thousand bucks it's you know it's a lot more than that it's not, right it's hundreds of thousands of dollars and the you know and the likelihood as we said earlier with the disruptive technology the likelihood that you get it back as things move as quickly as they do um you know that that's i think an eye opener and um you know, I think what Jay would say and what I would say is that you have to go into it with an exit strategy and you have to um, you have to be willing to walk away. So, you know, whatever you're you're spending on it, you have to have that that mental toughness and wherewithal to say, um, you know, this is my trigger point at this point. I can't continue to sink the ship. Um, and some of them have the greatest outcome ever. And you just have to be willing to to say, I tried my best and I walked away. And and I agree. I don't want this to be a bashing app development because it has been so fun. And I love continuing to do it. And I love the conversations like this. Um it's it's been an absolute blast to be able to do it well yeah and, and that's that's that makes uh it makes me feel good <laughs> at least that, that it's not all for for uh for not um and, and i think that that leads right into what i was going to ask for my last question but i think you you really summed it all up quite well there but i'll, I'll ask it anyway um so it, it, what advice would you give to to folks who are trying to, to who are in that the position of i have a really cool idea but i know nothing about what's what's going on right now like what advice would you give to them so that they can at least go in with eyes wide open and and continue to be excited to to work on their app um i you know i think that i would go back to the statement about having an exit strategy um and and i say that but that's such a vague comment to make because you don't really know your exit strategy until you get in there. Um, I think you have to find the right people to talk to, um, have the right conversations. I mean, we, we talked to so many development groups before we found a group that we felt like these people can help help us envision the direction and the person that we're, you know, chatting with is able to communicate to me in a language that makes sense. Um, I think my best advice is you just got to go for it. I mean, if you have the, the wherewithal and you have, um, the staying power, you got, you got to just give it a try because you're going to kick yourself for spending the money, but you're going to kick yourself for not trying as well. And I don't think that's any different across the board. It's no different than getting a college degree or, um, opening your own business or, 
you know, trying something new, going and running a 5K when you've done, never done anything, you've, you've got to just put yourself out there and develop really thick skin because there are going to be people who are not necessarily kind or helpful, but there are going to be a whole lot more people who are going to cheer you on and ask, how can I help? And, um, you know, put you in touch with people that that may have the right next steps for what to do. And it's just a really rewarding process. And um, if you can do it, absolutely go for it. That's that's really encouraging, and I, and I think that you summed it up perfectly. I, I think that people should should really, if you have the idea, at least at least jump in, talk to some people in the space. Don't be afraid of of sharing your idea because all developers are busy. <laughs> no, right. And, and, exactly. You know, no one's no. If your idea is is any good, the odds are that it's already out there anyway, and someone's already built that app. So um, it's not like you're uh, unless you have a really rare weird idea that's that's you know crazy then you know whatever but I, I would say most people don't fall into that boat just get out and, and chat with people go for it and just give it your best shot and see if it is something that you you know you can either if you are privileged enough to have the money to, to just yeah. do it then that's cool but if you are like most people and you have to go out and raise money and do whatever you know you need to do to at least give it a shot there's ways that you can dip your toes in the water and not uh not not uh just throw yourself off the deep end and and you know drown right away so exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, find that information. I think, you know, Jay would say over and over information is power and go out and ask the questions. And, um, you know, the worst case scenario is you, you collect a lot of great information and you opt not to go forward, but it's such an education in the process. And you learn, you just learn so much from different people, just even uh, technological terms, how to have different conversations with people. And um, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of great learning. That's 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 fantastic. Thank you so much for being on today, Amanda. And what if you would be so kind? Maybe you could uh, tell people how they can find out more about you or about FastSAC and and uh, and and keep supporting people like you that are trying to make the dream work. Absolutely. So uh, we have a website that is fastzac.com, and that's F A S T Z A C H. Um, on there, we have a link to um, our blog and newsletter. So we also. Uh, have a run like a local blog where we ask different people from different parts of the country to tell us about routes they love to run. And then we um, write newsletters, um, incorporate the routes just so we can learn and see what other people are doing across the country. Um, we're on all your social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at FastSack Routes. Um, LinkedIn, the whole bit, we're, we're out there and we always love to feed, you know, hear feedback, um, insight, ideas. We can't always incorporate them, but we sure love to hear from people. Well, and, and like you were saying before about people being cheerleaders for you, I, I would say that of anyone I've followed on social media, uh, Amanda is one of the biggest cheerleaders of, of me and the work that I've been doing uh, for, for a, a long time now. So I, I, I really do appreciate that. And yeah, everyone should go and sign up for that that newsletter and check out that blog because I, I learn something new about cities every time I read it. It's a fascinating read and I, it makes me wish I had. My wife used to be a flight attendant and we used to get oh, wow. um, like free flights around the country and stuff. Uh, uh, and, and I, I admit that's it just makes me miss that. Well, now she works at a brewery, so I'm I'm oh, pretty well, happy with it. The... another value add. <laughs> but and, I but it. you know, I, I, it is um, th those those uh, the content you put out is is incredible, and people really should take a look at that. So we'll, we'll put a link to all that in the show notes for for people to find it. Awesome, thank you so much, Tim. And um, you know, likewise, you guys have been so gracious with your time and input, and uh, it's all I think about the relationships and, and paying it forward and sideways and backwards. So uh, much appreciation. Uh, it's my pleasure. Well, uh, thanks, thanks for being on the show, and and um, best of luck. Thank you so much. Our guest today was Amanda Brooks. You can find out more about her and FastSack at FastSack.com. That's fast, Z-A-C-H dot com. Show notes for this episode can be found at ConstantVariables.co. You can get in touch with us by emailing hello at ConstantVariables.co. I'm at Tim Bornhold on Twitter, and the show is at CV underscore podcast. Today's episode was edited by the gregarious Jordan Doust. This episode was brought to you by the Jed Mahonis Group, who builds mobile software solutions for the on-demand economy. Learn more at jmg.mn.